to say about it. I, I think it's a marketing fund mostly for uh, it, it's it's also the thing of course which pays Linus the wage, but I don't know to what extent they still do the old printing thing because I don't hear much about it, but I do know they hire. Uh, there is, not, I don't think her name is Claire, but they have Claire, they have Amanda McPherson. And they have mostly marketing people, and then they have Linus Torvalds, and then they have the people who are associated with like Red Hat and Intel, and, and the people at the office in, in, in Portland, as far as I can tell, are loads of marketing people just doing PR and kind of managing the uh, reputation of Linux. Yeah, it's, I mean, like, like you say, it's. Um, there's some people in open source that get annoyed um, that you know everybody just assumes Linux is the end all of open source. That that's nothing against the foundation. That's just that's something like you say. It's one of the larger open source projects. Um, you know, it's I'm gl I'm glad to see the foundation keep growing, and I'm glad it's growing at the rate it's growing because it's it just makes the Linux core much better for anything that's based on Linux. I'm not sure what else you can really say on Did that. Did you hear anything about the open office situation today or yesterday? It's pretty serious now. You know, I've I've stopped kind of paying attention to open office because I'm pretty much convinced that with what Oracle's done there, everybody's just going to go, you know, viva la libre, and open office is going to slowly die over the next. Yeah, which is pretty. Five. I think they released the press release, something, something talking about like the survival of the project and the staff working on it. I think it's really drying up to an extent now. What I'm concerned about it with with LibreOffice is, is 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 the people running it. I don't trust many of them because they they don't not only used to work in Novell, they still work with SUSE, which is partly sponsored by Microsoft. Uh, and if you look at the contributions and you look at the graphs and how it changes over time, it seems like SUSE and Novell they, they do have quite a bit of control over the project. And it kind of means that people who are receiving in part their wages from Microsoft are maintaining this this, this fork. Uh, so, and I also got the impression from Rob Weir that from his comments, which he tried to kind of not amplify too much, he's, he wasn't he was never too happy with LibreOffice coming about, and I think the uh, throwaway of the project to Apache was partly uh, just trying to feed IBM with some code for uh, Lotus Symphony. Uh, but I, I think that the whole forking situation was just making things in some ways worse. Uh, even though I did support it at first, I, I'm just. But I, I think that the whole thing basically went quite bad when Oracle took over, and not just this project, just all kinds of projects that took over. Uh, uh, or Oracle really dropped. It, 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 if we want to look for somebody to blame here, it's not a big Microsoft conspiracy. It, it's Oracle just basically having no appreciation for what they were doing and who they were pissing off and everything else. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if your concerns are justified and down the road the Libre team tries to do something. However, if they try, I guarantee you within a month there will be a reforking and, and they will not they will not be able to do anything like that any more than Oracle could have tried. It's so because I mean open office has been around so long and Everybody knows the code. It's been open source. It, it's. I mean, I don't see how you could go down that road from here. Yeah, I, I'm not sure there is a road to climb now. I think loads of the office office suites are trying to find out how to do several things. So one of them is how to integrate users so they don't so they stop this horrible, horrible practice of sending attachments with bloody huge documents and do version control by like you know checking bloody attachments with your email. Different times. So that, that's the way loads of people work. And I just no, 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 no. Just, just change it, and try to work and keep version control proper. Uh, so, so the way that that's that's one thing they try to resolve. The Google, for example, is trying to improve collaboration by making things web-based, uh, and working collaboration and all kinds of stuff that they bought over the years. I mean, Google doesn't actually make software. It's Office, which just buys companies to do that, and then it just puts the Google, you know, the G on it, and then go Google innovation. Uh, so, so that's what they do, and Microsoft is trying to catch up with them, because what's good about it is the entry point. You don't have to pay anything to start. Uh, uh, to, you, well, you have, sometimes you have to pay a bit to, to get into it, but it's a lot cheaper than buying some, you know, carton with some plastic and some CD in it for something you don't actually need so many of the features of. 
Um, so, so I think when it comes to office suites, I think there is a certain lot of 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 office suites that you you're not quite so sure what to do with them in the future. You know, do we make them a mobile version? I, I, I think what the immediate future for office suites is is in between the two worlds you're talking about. It's one of the reasons I liked Open Office and like LibreOffice because I there's a plugin for it that lets me you know just tie into my Google Docs or other cloud-based things like that but manage them on a local application for the next three to ten years I'm really seeing a migration from the solely local to the centralized hybrid model and it may be stored on something like your Ubuntu one account or something but I think it's that's going to be more gonna... centralized, like uh, Net, yeah. like NetSuite or one of those kind of like trust us, you know, good uptime and put it, put all your database and timesheets and everything centrally somewhere, and yeah. uh, your and communication. Using that in conjunction with a local suite, you also have a local backup, but it's syncing with the, with the cloud-based backup. So if the cloud goes down, you can still do work and then sync after and and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, down the road, when the cloud becomes more reliable, and you know we have a few more cycles of Moore's law, and it's actually powerful enough to handle the equivalent of where you can't tell the difference between cloud and local, because there are times now where you really can tell the difference, especially when things start mm -hmm. lagging a little bit. Yeah, especially with swapping and things like that. Yeah, but uh, we're going to go through a hybrid transition period Why that catches up to the equivalent of what we have here. Yeah, the problem is people rely too much on clouds that they don't control, so they just hire some space or some CPU and get some ads for it or something. But they don't actually think about keeping control even on the server side. By Well, I suppose that's complicated. I'm not sure if it's complicated by design, by something from above, in the same way that uh, open Wi-Fi should have been simpler. You know, you, we we could have actually communicated loads of in, play, in loads of places directly, and not actually rely on ISP being very much in between. But but the, the, the there is an attempt to try and centralize things so they can censor and control what people do on the on the internet. And in the same way, I think there is a, a, an attempt. There is a reason for uh, people like in government not to want every person to have a domain and manage the email on the you know on my computer at home. They wouldn't want me to use. PGP to encrypt my messages and start to keep my messages locally because that would really, really impede their so-called enforcement, which kind of assumes that all of us are like criminals and like, I don't know, exchange. Well, and this, this is one of the reasons I don't like bandwidth caps and the hating of the current technology because I honestly think what we're going to have to do sometime between now and 2020 is just build the optical infrastructure out where I am hosting my stuff from whatever that day's equivalent of a tower is on my home optical connection and I'm relaying it through you know a peer-to-peer -to -peer torrent thing to distribute the load over the whole network you know put everybody's systems working together collectively is really the better way to alleviate these bandwidth conditions and with all these bandwidth caps and everything we're putting in we're basically breaking any chance of that software based infrastructure getting built out, which is, we, we're going to need it, because we're going to hit a bottleneck in the next well, decade. Well, exaggerate so. the cost of bandwidth is being exaggerated, it's an article I read recently, it's quite a pretty obvious one, but um, the, uh, I, I'm not sure about the infrastructure, the, there is the attempt to demonize uh, video, web. I mean, the more bandwidth you give people, just increase the resolution of what they stream down the line, so give them mm -hmm. uh, Higher resolution, it give them more bandwidth, it will increase the resolution, they'll start getting HD down the line, and some state will say, hey, what do you have a TV for? Just, you know, plug it into a big screen and, you know, stream well, no, it's like, that, That's the thing with, like, this Roku box that I'm switching over to getting rid of my cable. It's, it's TV quality, and that's the real threat there, uh, that really um, our our current infrastructure, cable, satellite, TV, and so forth, in, in that's your, one of the reasons they're demonizing video. We don't need it. We just need yeah. a big big pipe IP infrastructure. But in, the problem you have in the States is the companies that control the cables also control the you know cables. So cable TV is also, in some ways, controlled by the same companies that control, control your internet cables. Uh, so you don't have the separation. BT is not really a broadcaster. You don't have the BT TV or something. 
so so they don't have, they don't have to co to protect the TV monopolies uh, in the sense that they will not in improve the speeds well, of the line. What, what's so hysterical about that is um, it, like AT and T, one of the worst companies. When